The viscosity of a liquid depends on the strength of its intermolecular forces. Glycerol has relatively strong intermolecular forces and is rather viscous. Its resistance to flow is high. Ethanol, by contrast, has weaker intermolecular forces. It flows easily and has low viscosity. Viscosity is referred to as the resistance of liquids to flow. And viscosity is actually a pretty hardcore subject and stuff, but one of the many factors that influences the viscosity of a liquid is the intermolecular forces. And in this video, we looked at ethanol in the lower left and glycerol, which is in kind of the middle right. And if you look at the hydrogen, uh, excuse me, the hydrogens connected to oxygens and oxygens are red, you can see that ethanol has one OH and glycerol has three OHs. Well, the more OHs you have, the stronger the interaction will be for the molecules to other molecules. And glycerol, a triol, has three OHs. And so one reason why glycerol is slower to pour is that the molecules really hold on to each other and it's harder to get it to flow. Ethanol, on the other hand, with one OH would be flowing more like water, all right? Water and ethanol both have just individual OHs, so it's not quite the same. Viscosity is a lot of things. It's more than just the intermolecular forces, but one of the major forces in viscosity discussions is how much they stick to each other. Intermolecular forces will help out. Another thing about liquids is that, like we saw earlier, the surface of the liquid is where a lot of the action occurs. And the reason for that is liquid molecules on the surface have a net inward force. So the little liquid molecule there circled on the top, it's going to be pulled to the left and the right and down, but there's nothing over above it. The water molecule, they're kind of down towards the bottom of the picture, has water literally all the way around it, top, bo bottom, left, right, forward, backwards. So it's it's just having basically a net force. And this inward force is really interesting. It leads to this uh, phenomena called surface tension. And surface tension is just an energy that's required to break the surface of the liquid. And some substances have strong surface tensions and some substances have weak surface tensions. A paper clip is placed carefully in water, or rather on it. The metal clip floats because it isn't heavy enough to break the water's surface tension. By adding a small amount of soap, we reduce the water's surface tension. The paper clip sinks. Surface tension is really important for the biological world. Um, insects can actually float on water, and that's kind of their way, and birds come down and eat them or whatever. Things in biology I don't understand. But anyway, this is only possible because, again, the surface of the liquid is a little different. There's actually a little bit of force. And if you have small things like a paper clip or a bug, for that matter, they can actually float. However, you saw in the video that they added a little bit of soap to the water. That broke the surface tension. Uh, and then the paper clip uh, ended up sinking. If you have like an oil spill in the wild, um, the oil is like the soap. It breaks a lot of the surface tension. The poor little insects then can't float and they drown and stuff like that. So there's a lot of uh, implications for surface tension and understanding how it works makes you a better chemist. So which of the following substances do you think will have the strongest surface tension, okay? And again, strongest surface tension is gonna be related to the intermolecular forces. So let's think about these in terms of intermolecular forces. And if you look at those compounds, all right, the first compound has an SH, this is called a thiol. Um, sulfur, like oxygen, is gonna have two lone pairs on it if you draw the Lewis structure out. 
So A would be a compound which has dipole-dipole forces. It's polar, uh, so it's going to be pretty strong. The second compound has oxygen in the middle of two carbons. Oxygen, like the sulfur before it, if you draw it out, it's going to have two lone pairs polar, all right, but not hydrogen bonded because the oxygen is not directly reconnected to the hydrogen. So B would also be a dipole-dipole interaction. The third one, though, has that magical OH. And OH is one of the possibilities you can have for hydrogen bonding. The OH can connect to another OH and stuff and make that happen. And if you quickly look at D and E, there are a lot like A and B. They either have sulfur or they have oxygen not connected to a hydrogen. So I would predict that answer C is the right answer, and it is. Uh, as intermolecular forces go up, you have stronger surface tension. The soap is basically a nonpolar substance. It doesn't have hardly any surface tension. So stronger intermolecular forces, stronger surface tension. Cool. Capillary action is another function of these intermolecular forces. And there's a form talk thing we have to talk about here. Cohesive forces are interactions between like particles, and adhesive forces are interactions between unlike particles. And believe it or not, this can have a big effect when it comes to glass. Now, this is a, two pictures here of a glass, if you will, like a tube, all right, or a capillary, sometimes they're called. And we have on the left hand side a water molecule which is probably like a you can even think about it like wine all right wine has basically like a, um, a water in it of course with other things on the right hand side you have mercury all right and mercury is metallic which is another kind of a force and so water is a lot like the forces in glass all right, glass has an alternating silicon, oxygen, silicon, oxygen linkage. The reds are oxygens and the grays are silicon. And most glass is this kind of way. Silicon oxygen makes polar bonds and water is polar, hydrogen bonded polar even. So when you put water in glass, the water actually climbs the side of the glass molecule. So notice at the top there, the water actually makes like kind of a lower dip all right. And this is called a concave meniscus. Concave means it makes like a little U kind of in the water. Um, and that's because the water is actually climbing the surface of the glass. So glass is usually polar. Water is polar. It's going to grab on. These are the cohesive forces, if you will. On the other hand, in mercury, all right, you have then a convex meniscus. Mercury is a different kind of bonding from the polar glass and they don't get along really well. All right. So in these cases, then you're going to end up with a convex kind of a little bulge. You can see that the mercury is trying to get away, if you will, from the glass because they're different kinds of forces. It's a different kind of thing. So polar in polar substances in glass create concave meniscuses. And if you have anything that's not polar, i.e. metal or non-polar, or things convex it's going to make a little bit of a bulge when a piece of paper is dipped in water the water moves up the paper by capillary action the attraction of the water to the surface of the solid paper allows the water to rise against the force of gravity Paper is essentially a series of carbons with OHs on them, more or less. That's a very simple version of what paper is. But anyway, if you place paper in water, the water also likes, if you will, the uh, paper, and it will climb up. And this is another result of this capillary action. So if you've ever had a newspaper and, oh, I spilled my coffee on it or something like that, well, it goes all over. It doesn't just go where it poured. It actually like spreads out, and that's the capillary action. The cellulose is kind of like water, so they're similar kinds of bonds, so they get along, if you will, really well. Um, so yeah, so it spreads out. This is another effect of capillary action.